Chapter One, Peaceful Journey. It was still dark outside. I sat there early in the morning, slouched on an opulent velvet sofa in the massive living room of my mother-in-law's house. My laptop computer stared at me, but I lacked the courage to stare back at it. Well, maybe I glanced at it a few times. I fell asleep just before midnight and only slept for a few hours before waking up filled with anxiety. I was emotionally exhausted, yet the combination of adrenaline and trepidation was enough to keep my eyelids open, barely open. I tried my best to change my blank stare from the huge rustic beams that ran across the 20-foot-high ceilings back to my computer screen, but I just couldn't seem to force myself to do it. We always stayed at my mother-in-law Isabella's home when we came to Los Angeles. And whether we were there for business or a vacation, it always became a family affair. As I continued to sit there in the dark by myself, my wife, Valentina, quietly walked into the room. Honey, do you know what time it is? She asked. Um, no, no, I, uh, I don't, I murmured as I continued to stare at the ceiling. Babe, it's three o'clock in the morning. It's going to be a long day today and you need to get some rest. Come back to bed. Valentina said as she gently kissed me on the forehead. In an exhausted and distracted voice, I said, I can't sleep, and I have to prepare for my talk today. I still don't know exactly what I'm going to say. I certainly didn't lack content, but for the first time in a long time, I felt completely unprepared. I didn't know where to begin. I started developing the framework of this talk weeks ago, but every time I attempted to author my thoughts, I found myself going off on tangents none of which properly expressed the points I wanted to articulate. This morning was no different, as almost two hours had passed. My bloodshot eyes burned as they now stared at my blank laptop screen. The little mouse pointer kept blinking at me, urging me to author something magnificent, but every time I started typing, I found myself hitting the delete button as many times as my other keystrokes. I wrote my book, The Icon Effect, so easily as if I was the beneficiary of some sort of divine inspiration. Yet there I sat, with so many things to say, and no words on my laptop screen. It was now 4.53 a.m., and I still had nothing. I decided to make myself an Americano, hoping the caffeine would spark some literary inspiration. As I held the warm ceramic coffee mug in my hands, I reminisced over the many evenings I spent with my mentor, the icon, in this very room, talking about the future our feature. The icon was such an amazing mentor to me. To think that I was his protege turned son-in-law made me believe in miracles. I missed him so much, and while I was grateful for the time I got to spend with him, I felt incomplete without him. It had been just over a decade since the icon passed away, and though I enjoyed my fabulous lifestyle, a lifestyle that was funded by the company he gave me, I often thought about where my happiness truly came from. For so long, I yearned for financial success, thinking that achievements and accolades would bring me happiness. But over time, I found that my happiness had very little to do with the things I had acquired and more to do with the man that I had become in the process. Perhaps this could be the foundation of my talk today, I thought to myself. I had so many stories to share about how the icon and Joseph had helped me become not just a wealthy man, but a better man. I certainly had no shortage of inventory in that regard. These two men literally changed my life. Good morning, Papa, my nine-year-old son Cortez softly mumbled as he entered the dark living room, curling up next to me on the sofa. It's still really early, buddy. You should go back to sleep. It's going to be a long day today, I said, realizing this was the same thing Valentina told me two hours earlier. No, I'm good, Papa. Can I just snuggle with you? Of course, pal. You can always snuggle with me, I said, motioning him to come join me on the sofa. Cortez snuggled up next to me, leaning against my left arm, making it impossible to type on my computer. Valentina had taught me to soak in these moments, to take time to smell the roses, for moments like these are lost forever once they've passed. She would oftentimes tell me, Vincent, there will be nights and early mornings where our son will want you to hold him, and even when you're sleep-deprived and want to be left alone, Remember that one day Cortez will reach an age where he won't want that kind of affection from you anymore. She always reminded me to relish such moments. These types of lessons were clearly taught to Valentina by her parents, the icon and Isabella. I learned that the lessons that parents teach their children have multi-generational ripple effects. I was certainly the beneficiary of the icon's mentorship, 
but the blessing of being married to someone that could remind me of these principles when I needed them the most was a perfect example of that multi-generational ripple effect. We had planned on having more children, but after several attempts and two miscarriages after Cortez, Valentina and I decided to count our blessings and be grateful for our one and only son. And instead of getting depressed about not being able to have more children, it just made us even more grateful for the one we were blessed with. Now, oftentimes we have a picture in our minds of what we want our lives to become, and sometimes these expectations lead to us having feelings of entitlement. But I felt entitled to nothing, for entitlement is the architect of disappointment and resentment. I had always worried that something might go wrong with Valentina's pregnancy when she was pregnant with Cortez. So when he was born a healthy baby, I literally broke down in tears right there in the delivery room. He was more than I ever dreamed of. I was so grateful for our son's health, for I was acutely aware of everything that can go wrong during childbirth, both for the baby and for the delivering mother. Having two miscarriages was difficult for us to go through, and the last miscarriage put Valentina's life in danger. Miscarriages are so common, yet people rarely ever talk about having them. And I think this really does aspiring mothers a disservice. I've heard that so many women experience feelings of depression, guilt, and unworthiness when they experience a miscarriage, and mostly because they feel like they're the only one experiencing the inability to carry their baby to term. But the reality is, I know very few mothers that haven't had at least one miscarriage. I thought to myself, you know, perhaps this should be the theme of my talk today, that living more transparently regarding our own struggles can console and empower others going through similar challenges letting them know that they're not alone. And no, uh, that's too personal to share, I told myself. Just then, Cortez whispered, Papa, can you hold me? I put down my computer for a moment and held my son close. He wrapped his legs so intertwined with mine, we looked like a giant human pretzel. And these were the moments Valentina told me to soak in. For one day, these moments would be gone forever. We both fell back asleep on the sofa. My alarm finally sounded off at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I had nothing prepared for my talk that day. No well-articulated speech to read, no notes, and not a hint of progress. I told myself that perhaps it would be better to just speak from the heart. The icon once shared with me that some of his best speeches were not speeches at all, but rather organic, intimate fireside chats that just so happened to be in front of a group of several hundred people. Maybe my talk was meant to be one of these icon-style fireside chats, but despite how much I tried to convince myself of this, my unpreparedness made me feel like I was disrespecting the importance of the event. But even more importantly, I felt I was disrespecting the people that asked me to speak at it, for being chosen was truly an honor. It was an overcast Los Angeles morning, and although the Hotel 100 was only a few minutes from Isabella's home, on this particular morning, it felt like a journey to get there. As a driver pulled up to the valet, Valentina smiled at me and asked, Are you ready? I knew her question was in reference to a multitude of things. I just smiled at her with a very unconvincing smile, knowing that I was neither prepared nor ready. And she smiled back, giving me her signature reassuring grin that she always gave me when she knew I needed it. The lobby of the Hotel 100 was beautifully decorated. Francisco's new protégés were all up front, greeting the guests as they arrived. After the icon passed away, Francisco, his adopted son, inherited the remaining shares of the hotel. It had always been his pride and joy, for he built this empire alongside his adoptive father during his entire adult life. I had so many fond memories of working at the hotel in the early stages of my career as Francisco's apprentice, but today, Francisco would not be working the event he would be sitting in the front row. As the program began, I sat up in my chair, staring at the ground as I bit my bottom lip with apprehension. I felt Valentina's reassuring hand placed upon mine, but for the most part, I was lost in a world of my own as my mind raced, trying to gather my composure and formulate what I was going to say. I was still neither prepared nor ready. Next up, Vincent Montgomery will say a few words, said Pastor Curtis, awaking me out of my trance. I slowly walked up to the stage, still not knowing exactly what I was going to say. I adjusted the microphone as I stood behind the podium, clearing my throat several times. As I looked at the crowd, I felt like things began to move in slow motion. 
I could feel my heart rate slowly decrease the way a record player sounds when someone pulls the power plug. I slowly inhaled with uncertainty, held my breath for a split second, then released a long, stuttering exhale. As I surveyed the giant banquet room, it was filled with some of the most influential power players in the financial world, but the most important people were sitting in the front row. Isabella, Valentina, and Cortez, Francisco and his brothers and sister and their spouses, but no Andre. I attempted to clear my throat again a few times as I looked down at Valentina. She gave me her signature reassuring smile again, nodding her head as if to say, you've got this, just speak from the heart. I took another sip from the bottle of water I placed on the shelf under the podium and began. Many years ago, I walked into a high-rise building not far from here. I was told by my new mentor, the icon, that I was going to meet the managing partner of his wealth management firm for a 7 o'clock a.m. meeting, and I was going to start my internship working for him. Out of the conference room walked a man that looked like a real-life superhero to me. He greeted me as if I was a member of the club, and over time, he became part of my family, or more accurately, I became part of his family. His name was Joseph Balmain. I said, taking another deep breath to calm my nerves. I fought to hold back tears, but it was too late. They were already streaming down my cheeks. I continued. I was magnificently mentored by the icon himself. But Joseph, you know, Joseph was my day-to-day mentor. He gave me the constant encouragement I needed back when I was just getting started in my career with the icon. And even after I moved out to New York, while they were both out here in Los Angeles, My daily phone conversations with Joseph made me feel like my big brother was sitting right by my side. When I received the news that his jet crashed and that his entire family perished, that he, Christine, and his sons, it felt like the wind had been knocked out of me. Joseph and his family were on vacation in Barbados. The details of what went wrong on that flight still had not been determined, but I didn't care about the details. I didn't want to know the details. I had now lost my second mentor second to the icon. As I recounted my most precious memories with this great man, sharing them with the rest of the morning guests at the service, my eulogy became more of a tribute to someone I always aspired to emulate. There were too many amazing stories to share all of them, and no one story was any more precious than the other. They were all invaluable to me. Joseph not only taught me how to excel as a great leader and businessman, but also how to excel as a better father and husband. What made Joseph great was not his power, wealth, or status, but rather it was his humility and the way he loved his wife. It was the way he loved his sons. It was the way he loved me. Though Joseph was a masterful teacher, the most important lessons he taught me were not through instruction. They were taught to me through his example. And just watching the way he treated people Not just his family and his business associates, but everyone he came into contact with was a masterclass in humility and kindness. You know, as I said, he didn't just teach me to be a wealthier man. He taught me to be a better man. As I wrapped up my tribute, I looked at the beautiful picture of Joseph's family that was displayed on the right side of the stage and said, Joseph, thank you for being such an amazing big brother to me and welcoming me into your family. You looked like a superhero to me when you first walked out of that conference room, and you never stopped looking like a superhero to me since that day. As I walked off the stage, pausing to take one final look at the picture of Joseph and his family, I whispered in a trembling voice, I'm going to miss you, big brother. I wish you a peaceful journey.